So now I will pass it along to Dr. Dukoski to take us through the presentation. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, and welcome to everyone, both in the room and around the world. Um, the technology only works perfectly during rehearsal, and perhaps not necessarily during the actual. What I'm going to do is try and give you uh, information about the history and the background of Alzheimer's disease, why it is such a pressing problem, and enough about the mechanisms to understand why the current therapeutics are issues that uh, are not only of great importance, but also understand how focused ultrasound might be helpful in the uh, application of these. Have I been, um, I'm trying to advance the slides, everyone. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. Uh, nothing on there that's major, I'm regretful to say. <laughs> and I'll start with uh, why we call this Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Alzheimer, uh, when you see in the right side picture, looked uh, like professors should look, at least when professors were true professors, or a monocle, uh, although he happens to have his uh, uh, spectacles on there. And the patient who ended up giving him his name was the woman in the upper left, taken when she was in the hospital under his care. Uh, she died at age 55. I think this actually was taken when she was probably 52 or so. But when she was brought to him in middle age, uh, young middle age, uh, she had a mysterious progressive dementing disorder. Uh, she had trouble writing. She couldn't talk. She also was depressed. And when she died, he took the new silver stains, one of the number of heavy metal stains that were sweeping uh, Europe technologically at the time. Uh, they had been pioneered by Ramoni Cajal and Golgi, and uh, saw in her brain for the first time these uh, thick, ropey black structures that you see uh, in between Alzheimer and uh, Augusta Dieter. Uh, he also described uh, neuritic or amyloid plaques, although he did not know what they were. He didn't know what these were, and neither did we until the 80s and 90s, and I'll talk more about that as we move on. So when he published this single case report of this rare and unusual disease in 1907, it was called pre-senile dementia because the concept of senile dementia or losing memory and thinking function in late life was well known even to the ancients, uh, but it had not been uh, methodically looked at in terms of pathology because pathology was just getting its uh, traction in the late 1800s and early 1900s, largely in France, uh, Germany, Italy, and other uh, uh, research laboratories on the continent. And then uh, Sir Martin Roth, who was knighted by the Queen for this work, began doing studies in Newcastle, or Newcastle-upon-Tyne for the Shakespeare fans, uh, a, a community survey of nursing homes in which they tested people's cognition every year and had agreement to do autopsies on those patients and look at their pathology. And they discovered that if you remove people with significant numbers of strokes, that the people who died with largely normal cognitive function were uh, pretty much uh, clean-brained with respect to plaques and tangles, but that the people who had a cognitive uh, problem in late life, who were demented, had plaques and tangles that looked just like the brains uh, that Alzheimer had published initially in Augusta D and subsequently in a number of other uh, patients uh, who he reported as a series and then others around the uh, European continent began to uh, discover this phenomenon in older people as well. In fact, Roth's data even indicated a correlation between the density of uh, plaques, what they call the plaque index, and the degree of cognitive impairment, the first time any brain change had been correlated with clinical function. Um, The majority of the cases of dementia in late life, we now know, are Alzheimer's disease, and many cases show additional comorbidities. If you live to be 85, uh, the chances that you pick up a few dents in the fenders are 
high. And so only about 25% of people who die in late life with dementia have purely Alzheimer's and no other pathology. Uh, but there are also some other kinds of protein abnormalities which may be relevant to uh, therapy of focused ultrasound, but they are, um, uh, it's important to know that other things such as vascular disease, uh, some evidence of the abnormality seen in Parkinson's, even if the patients don't necessarily have symptoms of Parkinson's disease are also present in the brains of these patients. So let's start with a simple question since this is 101. Uh, what is the disease? It's a progressive disorder. It's a neurodegenerative process. Uh, we don't know why it initiates, but we have some very good ideas. It usually starts with memory most commonly, but it has an insidious onset and a progressive loss of first short-term memory. Then word finding problems, uh, which are often confused with those of normal aging, and subsequently what we call the frontal lobe or executive behaviors, the inability to plan, to judge, to organize things, and at the same time, preservation of remote memories, that is things that happened in your childhood or in midlife, and also with social behavior. One of the early before imaging warnings of our clinical mentors was beware the sloppy drunk, uh, or sorry, the sloppy dement, that someone who uh, didn't take care of their clothes, didn't behave appropriately socially with somebody who didn't just have normal senile dementia. They probably had something in the frontal lobes early, and that has still proven to be true, uh, although we find these cases much more quickly now because we have neuroimaging uh, ready. But the disease with its insidious onset progresses to lose eventually access to remote memory, to logic. Uh, most language goes away. Uh, a lot of behavioral symptoms emerge at some point during the disease, uh, personal neglect of uh, clothing and, and um, personal hygiene, as well as spatial orientation, which leads people to getting lost and making bad judgments about wandering around uh, in inappropriate weather, inappropriate garments, and so forth. And at the severe stage, uh, people are incontinent. Uh, they may have myoclonic jerks. Uh, which means they've really lost one of their neurotransmitters and eventually end up needing full assistance uh, for uh, survival. So this disease, this is what happens if you go all the way through the disease. Uh, our mission is to try and stop this from occurring, uh, and let me show you now what the effects of this will be. These were the criteria set in 1984 uh, because before this time there was no uh, uh, particular diagnostic uh, characterization of the disease other than the DSM-2 uh, and then early 3 diagnostic criteria. These were the National Institute of, at that time, uh, uh, clinical and, uh, sorry, uh, the National Institute, gosh, I'm blocking now, it's NINDS, is National Institute for uh, Communicative and uh, 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 Disorders and Stroke, and the ADRDA, which was the name of the Alzheimer's Association before they changed their name to do business as the Alzheimer's Association. You had to have dementia, which was established by clinical exam, and you had to have some kind of documentation. The mini mental status exam or the blessed uh, information test, the BIT, was what was popular in 84. We'll talk a bit about that. You had to have, and this is key, deficits in two or more areas of cognition. A simple memory loss was not sufficient. That's an amnesia. It's not a dementia. You had to have progressive worsening. You had to, in fact, have six months of history of it being progressively worsening by the time someone came to you, because otherwise a stroke could do this suddenly. People couldn't be uh, delirious or confused. Uh, the onset doesn't matter much. We know it occurs before 40 and after 90, but the major time it begins to occur the prevalence really climbs after 65. I'll show you that. And you couldn't have any other disease that might explain it. I mean, these were pretty logical, straightforward. And for the next decade, much of what we did centered around trying to be able to make an accurate diagnosis. CAT scans had just come into common use about 10 years before this. MR scans were just beginning to be spread all over the world, and they were expensive. And so not everyone got an imaging study when they came in with dementia, depending on where they were. 25 years later, Guy McCann, who was the chair at Hopkins uh, of Neurology at the time of this uh, study, um, along with uh, David Drachman, who was at the uh, University of Massachusetts, Marshall Folstein, who developed the M MSE, although he did not uh, intend it to be used for dementia. He actually meant it to be used for uh, schizophrenia and mental health disorders. 
with Bob Katzman, who was the chair at the Department of uh, Pathology at uh, Einstein, and uh, Don Price, who was head of neuropathology and a neurologist at the University of uh, at Johns Hopkins, uh, put forth this combined work group diagnosis. The criteria were down below. 25 years later, McCann led a group of the next generation of uh, researchers in the field to put together uh, a revised set. What was different? In 84, it was all about clinical judgment, input from the family, the neurological examination, the patient's input, the cognitive test. By 2011, two notable changes. Number one, we now think of AD as a continuum. We discuss three stages of disease, preclinical, mild cognitive impairment, and Alzheimer's disease. I'll tell you right now, MCI means there's a problem with one area of cognition, most commonly memory, not always, but I told you that the definition still includes two cognitive domains, impaired and slowly progressive, in order to meet the criteria for dementia per se. So MCI in many ways is an anticipatory state for developing AD. And the other notable change that biomarkers, notably in spinal fluid and neuroimaging, not yet in blood, uh, although we certainly hope we find those, were the uh, two, uh, was the other area which has changed the field remarkably. So now we think of three stages of disease. The preclinical stage, which means your cognition is okay. You don't have detectable abnormalities in cognition. And you must have measurable changes in the brain, either on an MR scan showing atrophy or a PET scan showing uh, some of the abnormal proteins or abnormal metabolism, or in the spinal fluid, and blood's included, although we don't have it yet, uh, before any cognitive symptoms are present. This will become a bit more clear. Then there is MCI. The MCI specifically due to AD means that you have one of these biomarkers indicating that AD is the likely cause of the MCI. Um, and uh, usually it's memory, uh, but you must have measurable abnormalities in one of the biomarkers. In an uh, international working group, uh, which was centered in Europe, uh, of which there were several Americans involved, uh, myself included, prodromal AD is the term that they preferred, and they have focused mainly on memory since it is the major um, and most commonly uh, presenting initial complaint. MCI due to AD is the terminology used in the U.S., but we use these interchangeably, uh, and we can discuss those more uh, in a bit. Dementia due to AD is the third, and this is the one that was defined in the early McCann criteria as Alzheimer's disease dementia. Two domains, biomarkers either showing amyloid accumulation in brain or biomarkers showing brain injury or degeneration of the brain. Um, right. So I'll tell you now that... The, I'll tell you now that the amyloid accumulation we will certainly discuss. Biomarkers showing brain injury or degeneration are largely of two types. They either are remarkable atrophy that is abnormal for age, uh, especially of the mesial temporal lobe and the hippocampus in particular, more than there should be, or evidence of tau or phosphotau protein in the spinal fluid. It's normally an intracellular protein, and if it leaks into the CSF, it means that there are injured cells. So that's the marker of degeneration, either atrophy showing shrinkage of brain parts or leakage of, uh, of intracellular neuronal parts showing degeneration. Now, this is a model that you've all seen. You live for a while and then you curve down and you die. Uh, not very optimistic, but here, here you see the issue about what clinicians are asked to do all the time. When do you take what is a multidimensional progressive continuum and decide what the categories are that people sit in. I gave a talk last week at the uh, American Academy of Neurology, and I call this the gray zone right here because when people in their, let's say, 60s start having problems with word finding, which everyone does, uh, it is a normal accompaniment of aging, uh, the kind that you later will figure out what that was, sit up in the middle of the night and remember that it was Betty Hutton, who played, well, not you guys, uh, it was Tom Cruise who played something uh, in some movie. This is a very difficult piece because it is the thing that would separate clinically the onset of a mild cognitive impairment from the decline that occurs in aging. And then eventually, as time goes by, uh, more severe disease and the emergence of a second domain of abnormality would lead to uh, the diagnosis of dementia. Now, 
We know that AD prevalence increases with advancing age, and that this has implications for some of the therapies that we talk about. But the major studies have shown that, that this curve, basically a doubling of the prevalence, that is the number of total cases in a population, uh, increases or doubles every five years from age 65 to 69 uh, up to age 90 to 95. We don't have enough data yet for people over the age of um, uh, 95 to know whether it will continue on, and this is still a major argument. If everyone lived long enough, would they all get the disease, or are there only certain people who will get the disease uh, during the, the normal uh, lifespan of mankind? Now, the other interesting thing, which tells us that there's clearly environmental and genetic influences are, if you look at these climbing prevalences uh, with the best data we have, and you look at the different um, uh, ethnic groups, that whites, African Americans, and Hispanics have different counts at different times. These purple, or sorry, these white numbers are the pretty classic numbers that we give for Caucasians, but usually we say by age 85 plus that close to 50% of the population in the U.S. at least has the disease, and here you can see that it is driven by a combination of higher rates in these populations. Much of the speculation has to do with environmental adequacies, even in development, that allow uh, what's called greater uh, neuronal plasticity or cognitive reserve that allows the normal brain to fight off the adverse events of vascular disease, uh, decreased blood flow, normal aging, and the pathology of the Alzheimer's disease itself. In 1950, this was the way the world looked to the extent that we had data that was reasonably reliable from the countries from whom we could get it. So you see there's no data from Central Africa, there's very little data except from um, uh, probably Sydney in, um, in uh, Australia, uh, relatively little except perhaps uh, Brazil and Argentina and South America, uh, and a not, a, not a lot of data on the Great Plains. And each of those dots, as I said, represents 100,000 cases. Europe and China and um, India, as well as Japan, showed a lot of information because they have a lot of people there. Now, if you jump ahead to 2000, and now we're in modern times, two things have happened. The first is there are filling in of a lot of places where uh, we didn't have any data at all. It isn't because the disease is increasing, although it is, but uh, detection uh, and organization to detect it is also showing up. And I call your attention, of course, to Europe. You've heard a lot about the aging of Western Europe, and that's what these are reflections of, of uh, India and um, uh, China and Japan. Uh, in Japan, the population is getting older. In India and China, the population is still young, but the population is long alive, and so there are still many, many cases of the disorder there. And Africa is now beginning to show it, as is South America. If you jump ahead to projections based on the numbers of people in the world, this is what uh, the world will look like by 2050. By this time, the boomers in all of these countries will have reached uh, the age of risk significantly. Uh, and as you can see, China, South Korea, much of the Pacific Rim, either because the populations are aging or because they just have so many people, have a massive amount. And of course, the uh, medical care systems in those countries are not necessarily as well organized as they would like them to be. Uh, you also see that uh, Europe has a, a really difficult problem. One note here, this is a case where uh, just unforeseen consequences in China of the one-child rule are coming to pass. The children of uh, Chinese culture are expected and honored to take care of the grandparents of the elderly as they are in Japan. And for 4,000 years, that has been the culture. Now, two things have happened. The first is the Chinese in in issued a one-child rule in an effort to control uh, population growth. And the second thing that happened was that after being agrarian for 4,000 years, the miracle of China's economic growth over the past 25 years has led people for the first time to migrate away from the family farms to uh, major cities. So now uh, a young man from northern China is in Shanghai uh, making his fortune. He meets a lovely girl from Sichuan. Uh, they marry, they have a child or two, but their two parents uh, are off in 
their agrarian area somewhere, and when they get old, uh, who will take care of them? The children aren't going to move back. The parents surely are not going to want to move off their farm to the city. And, of course, the, the sandwich generation children also have their own children whom they're trying to raise. So this has been an unforeseen circumstance. Similar issues, not as dramatic as that one, occur in Japan and especially in South Korea, where they already know that there is so much disease that they don't have enough people to take care of it, and they have been teaching their students, you may have read about this uh, in the New York Times about a year and a half ago, to recognize confused people on the streets. May I help you, uncle, is the, uh, the preferred introduction to them on the street to try and help them get care. So I think we're going to see more of these stories uh, as the number of people who are identified or not exceed the number of people who can take care of them with the associated uh, uh, fiscal problems, both for families uh, and for uh, the, uh, the medical systems. This is a United States shot of the growth of people with the disease uh, in the blue bar. The slope is more important than the absolute numbers. Uh, we think there are around five to six million in the country now. We're not certain. Uh, the red is the Alzheimer's cost to Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and as you can see, the costs are going to rise well over uh, a trillion dollars within the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, and the uh, the uh, federal investments in Alzheimer's, although they have gone up now to around $600,000, are that little green line that you see at the bottom. And unless something is done more dramatically to facilitate research, uh, the sort of uh, catastrophe of the numbers that I showed you before are, uh, it looked like they are going to come to pass. Uh, now, one good thing, here's the black line, which shows the total number of cases projected to occur. And just recently, within the last year, there was a stabilization predicted in the number of cases who were born between 65 and 75. And that shows, theoretically, a leveling off of the population in that group getting the disease, although not the group over 85, which actually has the highest um, uh, prevalence. Uh, this is supposedly, again, a whiff of the issue of the environmental modification, that these are uh, children who uh, grew up uh, with uh, perhaps uh, better education, uh, better um, uh, nutrition, better education and nutrition, especially during the pregnancy phases uh, of their parents, uh, and perhaps uh, a variety of other environmental things that we haven't identified. And what that would do is not stop the disease, but make them more resistant, so they are appearing not to have this problem yet. We'll see whether this holds up, but it was important enough to be uh, mentioned in editorials in the New England Journal uh, as not only a bit of good news, but also the fact that there are ways to modify the disease uh, if this proves true. The attraction of prevention, if you, because this disease is mainly in people who are late, on, uh, late in life, if you delay the disease for five years within uh, the calculation goes about three or four Decades later, the target we're looking to try and blunt, you would decrease the prevalence by half. If you took it to be uh, delayed it for 10 years, you would virtually wipe it out uh, because the vast majority of people who get the disease get the disease in their 80s. Now, even these small amounts, that's what the declining numbers are, show you tremendous numbers. So if you delay it for a year, you say, well, gee, that's not a lot, but that's a million people in the US who would not get the disease. Number's probably higher now. A one-year or two-year delay, a two-year delay is almost two million people who would not get the disease who might otherwise have gotten that. So the, the, these aren't trivial pieces, and they are the reason that public health has now come to work with the psychiatrists and neurologists and geriatricians on this disease. We'll turn to a little bit of the pathology, because this is what defines the disease uh, uh, in the brain of people with the disease. One is the tau proteins, which form into neurofibrillary tangles on the left, and the golden flames that you see on the right in that histology. Uh, it's an immunofluorescent stain on the left, and conveniently for our lab, there was a plaque right next to it. Uh, the plaque is a compacted core of a peptide called amyloid beta peptide or beta amyloid, which is a normal small metabolic component of uh, brain metabolism of a big protein called amyloid precursor protein. We do not know the function of amyloid precursor protein, but this material uh, forms, sticks together, and then the brain attacks it 
which is what that uh, sort of cloudy outer rim is in the blue picture, uh, consisting of uh, the inflammatory processes of activated microglia, astrocytes, which are also uh, activated, degenerating and, and bizarre-looking synapses, the contact points of neurons. Uh, on the right, if you look at the, um, this globular material, this is the same as this compacted white material, but this stain does not show any of the inflammation. So you see just where the abnormal proteins are in the brain. These are all amyloid plaque cores, and these are all neurons, pyramidal neurons, that have been outlined by the presence of the neurofibrillary tangles, which you can see here. Our job has been to try and match up what we know about the pathology of the disorder with the clinical status of humans. So we know that there are genetic predispositions and that the major uh, risk factor is aging. We know that environmental factors have an effect, although we have not been able to define them terribly well. They lead to altered protein metabolism. First, we think of beta amyloid, subsequently of tau, and then of some other proteins, which still appear to play at least as clear a role at this point in time. This leads to aggregation of these proteins, which we call plaques or neurofibrillary tangles. They are associated with cell death, which should not occur, with oxidative stress, uh, and with subsequently synapse loss, the final common pathway of communication in the brain, and cell death. And mitochondrial dysfunction, we also see energy metabolism alterations, which look like they come as a result of, although there may be some primary dysfunction we don't know about yet, uh, they look like they come as an abnormality associated with this pathological protein change. This is the period in which you are asymptomatic. Then there is a period where these changes are going on that is preclinical, i.e., no clinical signs. Then you get symptomatic or you get detection at the earliest time, we would call it MCI. And then at some point, you have advanced disease, not only just a, a diagnosis of someone with mild dementia, but also uh, all the way to the end point of people who are incommunicative and uh, uncommunicative and unable to, uh, to talk. There are risk factors for the disease that we know about, and, and risk factors are positive and neg. Genetic risk factors include three causative mutations in the human genome, amyloid precursor protein itself, and two of the uh, proteins that make up the enzyme that metabolizes APP, called presenilin-1 and presenilin-2. I'll show you more of that in a minute. And then there is one major, although we have probably about 22 risk alleles so far, genetic variants that don't cause the disease but increase the risk. By far, the major one is in the apolipoprotein E gene, which has three variants, ApoE, paradoxically, 2, 3, and 4, and ApoE4 is the one that is associated with elevated risk. At the same time, if you break out the protective factors, looking back at people who do or don't have the disease and saying, what was different about their lives if they're being followed in an epidemiological study, the things that pop out most consistently are especially education, more education means less prevalence, uh, cognitive activities, physical activities, and uh, social networks and their width associated tightly with engagement in games or uh, uh, fun activities with your social network. Those are all associated with less disease. So here are the three genes that cause the disease, and the only thing uh, for this group that I'd like you to know is that all three of these raise serum and CSF levels of beta uh, amyloid as well as APP itself. Um, in trisomy 21, or Down syndrome, the trisomy, or the uh, extra long arm of chromosome 21, is where the APP gene is. And so everyone with Down has a 1.5 times the normal gene dose, and they have 1.5 times elevations of APP and A-beta over all of us. Uh, and all of these people get at least the pathology of AD, both plaques and tangles, by age uh, 40 or so, and most of them, if not all, not all are detectable, uh, by in their 50s usually have some cognitive uh, abnormalities um, and degeneration of whatever level of behavior they've reached. The risk allele, on the other hand, on chromosome 19, uh, the, the linkage was found before the actual gene, turns out to be apolipoprotein E, and specifically the E4 allele. It diminishes, it's associated with diminished beta amyloid clearance, and there is a gene dose effect. If you're a, heter, a, homozygote, a heterozygote, you have one copy of E4, your risk above those who don't have that allele is three times greater. If you have, uh, if you're a homozygous, you have an 8 to 12 time risk for developing Alzheimer's disease, and you develop it uh, 
earlier in life, uh, usually in the late 60s or early 70s are when symptoms begin. So this is a real risk allele, and it's probably no accident we believe that the reason E4 uh, does this is because normally in the periphery it carries cholesterol around, but in the CNS it ferries beta amyloid around. And it isn't as good, it appears, at doing its ferrying job to remove the material if it is made up of the ApoE4 allele uh, making up the lipoprotein than if it is made up with the ApoE3 or the ApoE2. In fact, the ApoE2 may even be protective. How do we find this out? If you look at the Caucasian populations, the E2 is the rare allele. Uh, this is an allele frequency. If there are 50 people in here, we have 100 alleles. This is the way geneticists look at populations. 7% of the 100 alleles in the 50 people would be E2s, 80% would be E3s, and about 14% would be E4s. If you look in the clinics, uh, and it doesn't matter here if you look in the ADRC the centers around the world or in the clinical trials or clinical studies uh, that just observe people, almost half of the people who come in with disease are uh, E4 positive. So clearly this is a risk factor for the disease. We believe that it impairs removal, that this allele is associated with impaired removal of beta, and we also believe that it, in some animal studies there's uh, evidence that it diminishes neural regeneration. And that makes sense, actually, given that it's supposed to be a cholesterol carrier, and maybe it's not as good as that either. And could we use this as a medication way to speed trials up? And this, in fact, is exactly what's finally happening with the Alzheimer's Prevention Initiative, where people with E4 are being utilized to um, uh, do studies because they would give the fastest answer uh, to outcomes. Now, this is the only mechanistic uh, study that, or uh, slide that I'll show. Uh, that big, tall, orange and blue stalk in the middle is a uh, totally anatomically accurate rendering of the APP protein, complete with its seven transmembrane uh, uh, passages here. And normally what happens to this protein, like a, inside the membrane, it's got a short root, the, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, area that is uh, anchoring the cell. And then the, uh, the end terminus region is the long extracellular tail. And it usually is cut right here at what's called the alpha site, because that's the first cut we always discuss. <laughs> And when it comes off, it forms uh, what's called soluble APP alpha, which is actually a trophic packet, uh, and, and has some resemblance to uh, uh, neural cell adhesion molecules. But the problem with this is that the orange labeled group is the uh, uh, line is what's deposited in the center of these plaques up here, which means this cut didn't occur, and the two others must. And here's one, the beta site made by base one, and a gamma site here within the membrane, which is very uncommon because usually enzymes that uh, cut proteins don't cut them in the middle of the membrane. And the, the gamma secretase, it turns out, is comprised of four proteins, uh, presenilin one or two, AF1, PEN2, nicastrin, uh, named because they're discovered at different points. And this is the one that if you mutate either one of these, you end up developing autosomal dominant disease. So something about amyloid metabolism looks like it goes bad in those cases, probably not an accident. When the beta and gamma cleavages occur, you get this small soluble molecule, usually 40 or 42 amino acids long, and this one looks like the very sticky one that leads to lots of trouble. Uh, they First you form monomers, then dimers, and then they aggregate and form polymers or oligomers as we refer to them. And from there they go on to form amyloid plaques, and then as I showed you earlier, they're attacked by uh, the normal immune system trying to get rid of them, and you get inflammation and neuron loss, et cetera. So every one of these mechanistic pieces that has been worked out over the past 20 years is a, an opportunity for therapy. We are currently looking at base inhibitors, trying to stop it from uh, making that first bad cut. Gamma secretase inhibitors have been in trials, and so far, uh, I don't know if there are any still advancing. The last one in a major trial not only made things worse cognitively, but also caused a lot of adverse side effects. So I think the field is reassessing their use. Soluble antibodies uh, are a major target of a number of uh, antibodies. Uh, sorry, soluble A-beta is a target of antibodies trying to pull them out of brain, as are either conformational antibodies uh, or antibodies to oligomers or to 
uh, the fibrillar forms, which are those which are formed by plaques. And all of these are areas of research. Some of them are in phase three trials now and many more in the laboratories. Now, tau is the other mysterious player here. This is uh, one of the Augusta D pictures here taken from what he called ghost tangles or tombstone tangles, or clearly there was a neuron there is no longer. Here's a neuron still alive. Uh, here's another one still alive. Uh, you can see they do, it doesn't go into the um, nucleus, which is why you have these open uh, uh, areas within even the tangled neur even the ghost neurons. And the, the tau protein job is to stabilize the lines of microtubules which form the, the heart of the axon. It's on these railways that uh, proteins and trophic factors go back and forth between the synapse, which may be a couple of centimeters away, and the cell body. You can compare what the tau does to a railroad tie, that if you have ties, they stabilize the rails so that a train can go over them, but if you were to cut the rails or have them taken away from the steel, then of course the rails would splay and nothing would be um, able to travel. The same thing happens here, that once you take away the map, you begin to get dissolution of first the microtubules themselves and then they uh, fall apart into their individual protein components. Now this doesn't happen all at once like you would take a hacksaw to this. But while this is happening, clearly there would be episodic function of communication between neurons, and it's probably one of the several reasons that there is not only an episodic change and a very slow and progressive change, but also really good times and really bad times in individual patients, depending on the multiple statuses of their um, metabolic states. We know that tangles do not form randomly in the brain. They always start in the anterior and perirhinal cortex and in the hippocampus the human brain RAM chip. It's where our recent memory has to, you have to have this if you're a mammal, and you have to have two of them in order for them to, for your memory to work. It's probably no secret that uh, memory function is one of the first things that goes out in this disease, and then it spreads to the various areas of cortex until it spreads almost everywhere, except for the places it never goes, like the motor and sensory cortex. And we do not know why they are protected yet, but it does do this predictably. One of the other mysteries is, it's not the same pattern about where plaques form. Plaques form predominantly in the cortex, and we know a lot more about this now with amyloid imaging. And then they begin to move down into the hippocampus, which doesn't actually have a lot of it, and then into the anorhinal cortex, and then into other subcortical areas. So they, are, they aren't matched exactly, uh, but they both are part of the disorder. Uh, and there have been several studies showing this uh, neuropathologically uh, different status, and, and now we have imaging for both. So now this is the picture from 20,000 feet. Uh, we've talked about this uh, in different forms. Normal on the left, presymptomatic AD is next. Notice there are lines between these continua. Mild cognitive impairment is next, and then Alzheimer's disease. We used to say that this would be uh, secondary prevention, uh, but now we would say that this is simply early treatment because if we're going to treat somebody with MCI for, with an AD drug, we want to know they have AD, and if we confirm that, then it's just early treatment of what is going to become AD, and I'll show you why we know that in a minute. The biggest thing that has happened, and maybe uh, focused ultrasound will be a party to this story as well, has been the evolution of our technology of neuroimaging. We started with CT in the old days, uh, before which uh, we would do angiograms or neuroencephalography to determine if there was atrophy or a tumor in a demented patient. MR scans brought a higher uh, resolution uh, as well as uh, better uh, looks at vascular change. Volumetric MR let us look at things over time to see if things were shrinking faster than they should, and co-registration of that led to volumetric comparison. This is a study from now almost uh, 14 years ago. Uh, it's on one patient with autosomal dominant disease 24 months later compared to normals of the same age, and the green areas are shrinking faster than the normal age match controls, and the red areas are those areas that are enlarging the ventricles. So this is a two-year snapshot of a single person. Here is uh, data. These are now five or six years old, and wherever you see the blue going away, it's where we are seeing loss of cortical thickness in those brains, and 
uh, these were done six months apart. So we have incredibly sensitive ways of looking at atrophy. Why is this important to look at atrophy? Because if we have something that actually stops the disease, either in prevention or in disease, it means that uh, we should expect to see volumetric stabilization or a slowing of the decline. And finally, the two metabolic abnormalities in glucose PET, meaning the energy metabolism has decreased in this characteristic pattern of the parietal lobes, the nose is up here for those of you who aren't familiar with looking at these, and then uh, most recently amyloid imaging, uh, these red and orange areas are areas that show you neuritic plaque, and I will show you this again in a minute. Uh, here you see there's no amyloid plaque in the sensory or motor cortices to uh, any extent. So how does that reflect anything diagnostic? Well, here's beta amyloid in normal people, and here is tau in normal people. Beta amyloid is normally an extracellular fluid, and tau is normally intracellular, and therefore in the spinal fluid, you shouldn't have really high levels of tau. It means a little bit is leaked out. Just like you can have liver enzymes in the blood, but they shouldn't be high if you get uh, uh, liver cell disease. You kick up your levels of uh, hepatic enzymes, same with a heart attack when you begin to see intracellular heart enzymes rise after chest pain. So with cell injury, the tau goes up, and you see this reflected in the spinal fluid. So an elevated tau or phosphotau, uh, or both, is a marker of brain injury. And in amyloid, the CSF levels are low, less than 50% usually, of the levels that are seen in people who are normal. Why is that? Well, we believe, and I'll show you a slide that seems to confirm this, that the reason they drop is because as they rise slowly over the lifespan, they eventually reach a, essentially a supersaturated place where they begin to aggregate into plaque. And when they do, when they aggregate into plaque, the concentration in the fluid drops, just like it would in a supersaturated solution in a chemistry class. Now, this has real implications, not just for diagnostics of AD, but if you take people with mild cognitive impairment and do a lumbar puncture and measure beta amyloid and tau, if they don't have changes, if they look normal, over five years, even if they had mild cognitive impairment, the number of people who will develop or progress to Alzheimer's disease is very low, less than 10%. But if you already have low amyloid and high tau, there is a 90% likelihood that over the next five years, these people will progress to Alzheimer's disease. So it's a powerfully predictive test to have. We have this available clinically. We don't use it much because uh, if you're not in a research program, it doesn't make a difference in terms of what, how we would treat you, so no reason to do a lumbar puncture. But uh, if we were able to image amyloid in humans uh, with the argument that the amyloid deposition begins years before you see clinical symptoms, we could certainly ease diagnosis. We could also make prognoses. Uh, we could monitor anti-amyloid therapeutic interventions, which was the reason that the first uh, anti-amyloid drug, Pittsburgh uh, anti-amyloid ligand, Pittsburgh Compound B, was developed by uh, my uh, then colleagues at the University of Pittsburgh, Chet Mathis and Bill Klunk, and their aim was to make it much more efficient to develop drugs that would remove amyloid from the brain. Their medication, PIB, called flutametamol, is now, uh, we did it with C11, but and I'll show you some C11 pictures, but F18 is a commercially viable form, and that is Visimil by uh, GE. For beta peer, which is Amavid, uh, is owned by Lilly, and this was actually the first one approved for use, and most recently for beta ben, uh, which is, uh, or Neuroseq, uh, as its uh, uh, brand name is by Pyramol. All three of these are approved by the FDA for imaging. However, no one pays for them yet because, like the LP, uh, there is nothing particular that you would do with them, so the studies are done in research. This is what a full uh, scan looks like in a normal. You can see it's a normal elderly person. He's got atrophy in the parietal lobes, normal atrophy, but no evidence of PIB, no evidence of amyloid. And here's a person in full bloom uh, with amyloid, only a mild case actually, but clearly you can see uh, the, um, the, uh, the difference between these two. This is what it looks like. Let's see if I can make this work. If you superimpose the amyloid load on the uh, MR scan, not. You superimpose the amyloid on the MR scan. There we go. You can see if you uh, do co-registration, all the frontal lobe deposit, the paramedian deposit, 
and the temporal lobe deposits of amyloid in a single person. An amazing view that I can tell you 20 years ago, we had no clue that we would ever be able to visualize it like this. And of course, if you're talking about anti-amyloid drugs, these are the kinds of tools we'd like to have. I showed you the picture before of, this, of the lumbar puncture that showed that some people with mild cognitive impairment, if they had a positive uh, spinal tap, were going to go on to develop Alzheimer's disease, but some people didn't have that. And so here is what happens in imaging. This is PIB imaging, or amyloid imaging, and mild cognitive impairment. Let's just look at this one area. It's the paramedian area called the, um, this area right here called the posterior cingulate. And what you see are in these MCI cases, here are all these cases who have elevated levels of uh, amyloid retention in their brains. And here's a couple who are normal. And there's their normals, and here's a guy who's a little bit high. So these people probably would not get a diagnosis of MCI due to AD or prodromal AD if you were in Europe. But, and these people are as expected controls, they're all the same age here, but this person is someone whom we would watch because although they are clinically normal, they look like they have an abnormality, uh, the beginnings at least of an elevation of their, um, of their uh, uh, amyloid buildup. Now those bars are the averages between the controls and the MCIs in this region. They're pretty meaningless because if Bill, uh, uh, Gates uh, or near Neil Cassell walked in this room, everybody's uh, average income would go up immensely, uh, but none of you would have any more money. Uh, so these averages don't mean much. It is really, are you high or are you low, because that will dictate your risk of developing the disease in the future. And this is the interesting proof, we believe, that why a low amyloid is associated with a positive scan, meaning you have plaques. So everything above this line has a normal beta amyloid in the spinal fluid. And what you see is that if you've got a normal beta amyloid, they're all in the range that have negative scans. If you look over here where the scan is positive, where the scan, uh, the SUVR of fluid metamol is abnormal, all of the, virtually all of the cases are low with a couple of uh, small numbers of exceptions. So we believe this is true. This, some of this, uh, there's lots of discussion about these cases, but it doesn't stop us from saying it appears clearly that at some point when, I'm sorry, at some point when you begin to see uh, lower levels of CSF, you have high plaque. And in fact, when we talk about people who are pre-symptomatic, we use either of these markers uh, in combining data. So the question now would be, could you identify people who have AD pathology in their brain before any thinking or memory problems develop? i.e., is there a way to use prevention? This also would immediately stop the problem I talked about early, which is can you distinguish the very early AD from normal cognitive changings, the changes of aging? And the answer is yes. These are all cognitively normal people from a study at the University of Texas, Dallas, and everybody read there, these are uh, amyloid scans, everybody with a red dot has been read as a positive scan by the neuroradiologist, blinded to their cognitive status. Mm -hmm. So what you see is that the majority of people here from age 30, of course, uh, to age 90 have very low normal levels of this material or nothing, but these actually have a significant problem, uh, and it, you don't really begin to see it much until 60. Some see it in the 50s. And there are similar data from all over the world. So we believe that this is the sequence in which things happen, and now you can see down the bottom, pre-symptomatic, early MCI, late MCI, and then frank diagnosable dementia, the first thing that we cool, okay. the first thing that we um, see is an elevation of abnormality, either a decrease in CSF beta or an increase in amyloid imaging. Then you begin to see the metabolic changes on a scan, synaptic decreases in activity. Then you begin to see the atrophy, because functional changes occur before anatomical changes usually. And then you start to see the leakage of CSF tau. And then you begin to see the uh, early MCI and then late MCI. Uh, and then finally, cognitive changes emerge and functional, because usually mild MCI, by definition, has no interference with function. You've got to be able to do your everyday life, but just come, somehow compensate for your short-term memory loss. Now, we also will add to that, uh, there are three of them, I think. Here's the three, be fair to everybody, a group of compounds from Tohoku. Avid bought um, uh, Siemens biomarkers, uh, T807, and it's made it AV1451, and a series from Chiba uh, from the National Institute of Radiological Sciences called PPB3, 
Uh, there are three tau markers, and here's what it looks like. Here's a healthy person with no uptake. Here's a mild MCI, and you see a little bit in the temporal lobes. Here's a person with uh, mild AD. Uh, this is kind of on the border between mild and moderate. You clearly see temporal lobe and some more posterior areas which have it. And then here's a severe case uh, of Alzheimer's, and you see these changes. You see they've spared those uh, paracentral structures. And this is a comparison of what the path distribution, relative path distribution of uh, tangles looks like. Uh, I think this is from Brock, uh, compared to the um, tangles on the scan. So we're on, this, on the trail of, of tau as well. This is important because the tau changes are the much more correlative with cognition changes. You might expect that because we see amyloid 10 or 15 years before we ever see cognitive change. It obviously doesn't have a big correlation with cognition on its own. Tau does. Can we get amyloid out? We can. Uh, the first vaccine trial in the early 2000s showed it. I'll show you a picture of that briefly. And the bapanuzumab first antibody trial, the complete in phase three, also showed it. Uh, does it matter? And how much do you need to get out? Uh, it doesn't look right now like it's going to work well as a treatment for symptomatic AD, mainly because it may not stop the process at that point, but also because it may just take too long to work. And it might be well suited to either very early or absolutely pre-symptomatic therapy to get the plaques out before symptoms occur. And since symptoms don't occur for a decade or more after you start to see plaques, we have time to get it out. Maybe you have to get it all out, we don't know, but you have years. The problem is the trials to show this will be long and extremely expensive. I apologize, this is very sensitive. So this is, uh, at the top, a, a patient who was untreated uh, and a stain for amyloid, and you can see the plaque all over the cortex. On the right is a, um, uh, a high magnification of that. Down below, uh, one of the first people who died with the disease, and you can see that the amyloid plaque is pretty much gone from those areas of cortex. You see some on the left on the low power in the subcortical regions, but um, not in the temporal region at the bottom, of which the high power uh, over here in the bottom right uh, shows that the plaque is, is pretty much gone. So that was the first evidence that you actually could get plaque out of the brain. Uh, there were side effects to that study, and th there are other vaccines on the way potentially, but that won't happen. This is a very well-known bapanuzumab phase two trial that did not show a positive effect. It was an antibody study. But if you looked at the imaging that was done during the trial, what you see is this slow emergence of a decrease or at least stability of the levels of amyloid plaque in the brain compared to placebo. Placebos either get stable or go up, they never go down. We've looked at lots and lots of images and they don't go down. So by the 78th week, week, year and a half study, there actually was a significant difference between the treated patients and the non-treated patients. And not everybody got uh, images done, et cetera. A lot of uh, ifs and buts here, but similar to the data from the, the vaccination study. And here are a couple of examples at the top two patients who were treated. Here's somebody who had some pretty definite frontal and paramedian changes, and here's what that person looked like a year and a half in. They got drug. Here's a person uh, also at the start who virtually cleared the deposits by a year and a half. And here are two people, beginning of study, end of study on placebo, beginning of study, end of study on placebo. So not complete, but from now on, all of these studies will have these kinds of things done. And these studies began in the late 90s, uh, the late uh, aughts, uh, before uh, we knew how valuable and important it would be to have these studies. So uses of biomarkers and diagnosis, amyloid plaque formation is seen first and followed by other changes. We have a lot of work to do on the trajectory and its variability, but we know that different biomarkers provide different levels of certainty in the diagnosis of MCI due to AD or in the diagnosis of AD itself. Criteria that outline testable hypotheses are uh, now all being done, uh, uh, being put together, and they are probabilistic. Uh, right now, they're all being used in academic research and in clinical trials. No one will ever do an anti-amyloid drug trial again without doing amyloid imaging on everybody to make sure they're positive before they get in. Uh, we will probably clinically use them for difficult cases clinically, and the major limitation will be the expenses uh, of the imaging, even though they will probably review, uh, have no doubt. What does the FDA and Center for Medicare Services say? Uh, 
For diagnosis, the only thing they'll approve is, because they don't know exactly how people will read positive scans or uh, artifacts, if there's no amyloid, then that would indicate a low likelihood of AD, and that's what the approvals have all been based on. Remember that a neuropathological diagnosis of disease requires amyloid plaques, and therefore evidence of amyloid plaque on PET says that amyloid pathology is, is present. But the FDA is uncertain about exactly how, whether you read one positively or negatively, how well will people be trained, and so they have only said that uh, it's approved for a rule out, essentially, low likelihood of disease. Now, if amyloid is present in somebody with MCI, the cause is likely Alzheimer's disease, but uh, no CMS funding for any amyloid scans is uh, available for either AD or MCI because the benefit of early diagnosis with PET is not proven. In other words, if we tell you for sure you've got it, uh, how would you do something differently? Well, what you would do is go be in a clinical trial, but Medicare is not going to pay for that for clinical care, but they have approved this payment for CED, what's called clinical evidence development, and a number of research studies are going to apply to CMS to use that as a way to pay for the uh, imaging studies as they move forward with research. And finally, what would the role of FUS be in AD? Number one, could opening the blood-brain barrier allow alterations to disrupt the equilibrium between the CSF and blood and facilitate removal of the plaque? Would opening the barrier allow medications to cross the barrier even more easily and also either facilitate removal or put something else in that may, might block another pathological cascade in the disease that has gone beyond amyloid itself? Uh, we know that uh, there is an equilibrium between amyloid in the brain and the, in the CSF and the blood uh, because uh, only about 10 to the minus 4 by weight of any gamma globulin, which is a gamma G, which is what the antibodies are made of, gets into the actual brain. So in many cases, what's happening is the antibodies are binding in the periphery to all of the beta in the blood, you remove that with the antibody, and then you therefore disrupt the equilibrium and you pull it out of the brain by virtue of the fact that there's a lower level than the equilibrium was there with the blood. And so this would make it even easier to get the material out uh, if you open the barrier with fuss and then put in the antibody. It would have much less trouble, more of it would get in wherever the barrier was open. But even the opening of the barrier itself, I think, may cause some remarkable changes because uh, once you expose the, the, the brain to the blood, the high concentrations, remember this stuff is piled up in uh, amyloid plaque, those much higher concentrations are going to flow down, and therefore it is quite possible that you will see that. And in some of the very preliminary mouse studies uh, of animals who are genetically engineered to have a lot of plaque, it looks as if it does result in the removal of plaque as well as in some increase in cognition uh, in those mice who also have some degree of memory uh, problems. So I put this at the tail end because I think understanding the mechanics as well as the difficulties in the disorder uh, are the best place to start. That was also the request I had in, in calling this Alzheimer 101. And now with what you know about uh, focused ultrasound and its potential mechanisms, and especially, hopefully, a minimum of um, uh, severe adverse effects, uh, the discussion will go on about how wide a view can you have of this, should you or could you just target areas in any individual brain that just have plaque, how many times can you redo it, how wide can the area of focus be, uh, or will you have to do this by a series of dots, uh, and then what's the rate at which you might expect plaque to go away, i.e., how frequently should you do amyloid imaging, uh, and of course, uh, most importantly, uh, what will happen to the patient's cognition if you are able to get the material out without hemorrhage or uh, any of the other side effects that right now haunt us a bit about using antibodies to get materials out of the brain. Uh, and uh, I'll stop there, and if there are questions, I'll be happy to try and answer them. much biology for the physicists. <laughs> no. I think that was
much physics for the biologist. <laughs> I've been reading their papers. <laughs> you talk a little bit about what a clinical trial to improve effectiveness of focused ultrasound might look like. How many patients would be influenced? How long would they have to be followed? Uh, Okay, so let's divide this into three groups. One would be people who have autosomal dominant mutations and they're all going to get the disease. And we have studied a lot of these patients uh, when I was in Pittsburgh and we know the families breed true. So if a particular family with a picture mutation, they're all going to get the disease between 35 and 40, let's say. So one thing you could do, and this is being done now in Columbia with a very large family as well as by the amyloid, uh, by Diane, the, the, uh, uh, the group that is uh, looking at autosomal dominant families in the United States following them and trying to treat them, that you would give them the therapy, uh, I'll say for now it's an antibody therapy, and see if they don't emerge, if they're normal, if they don't emerge with the disease during the period when they're 35 to 40. And let's say you can find enough people who are 35 to 40 and start giving them antibody and seeing if they're 42, 43, they don't have the disease. So that's you see a long trial, probably the shortest one we have. Second would be... This, where does focus ultrasound fit into the antibody? Well, focus ultrasound would be used to in, the antibody? In two ways. In two ways. Because there's, there's... Neil asked exactly, I think, the right question, which is how does it help? So mm -hmm. I think the question is open first about whether focused ultrasound itself would produce a drop in... Um, in uh, uh, levels of plaque in the brain. I think you have reason to think that that should happen because it does that to the mice. We've cured al Alzheimer's disease in a lot of mice. Uh, unfortunately, when we do, when we take those uh, uh, medications, gamma secretase being a great example, into humans, humans are much more um, uh, complicated and mice don't complain about side effects. So. One of the first questions I would have is, if you just used low-powered uh, FUS to open the barrier, and we're trying to design the study right now with a group of colleagues, would you open the barrier for an amount of time that would allow you to see a quantitative decrease in the amount of plaque? You could do it in people, as I said, who have uh, autosomal dominant disease. You could do it in people who have mild cognitive impairment and a positive scan. Actually, you wouldn't do this to anybody who didn't have a positive scan. And you could do it to people who have mild Alzheimer's disease or moderate Alzheimer's disease and see whether or not they would not only remove the amyloid but would slow down their cognitive changes. And here's where the complexity shows up. If we did a, 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 a focused ultrasound broad addressing to a brain of a person with AD, and let's say miraculously all of the plaque went away, it would still take us six months to a year to see whether or not removal had altered the course of the disease in a person who already had the disease. Because they aren't likely to immediately get better. Remember, it's the tau that has been associated with cognition more than, than amyloid plaque. But if amyloid plaque is pushing the pathology constantly, something we don't know. Some people think that tau takes off and continues to spread, as I showed you, and cause the cognitive problems. We, that's a, a testable hypothesis. We would have to see if that works. So it may be that like many of these amyloid uh, uh, treatments, antibodies or uh, uh, enzyme inhibitors, you'd need to start earlier and earlier and maybe use anti-tangle and anti-inflammatory therapies for people who have symptomatic disease. We don't know. Those of us who are agnostic with respect to which one would work uh, don't care. Uh, we'll, we'll do all of these studies have to be done. What's the first one I would do? Uh, I would probably try first in a person who had nothing to lose i.e. somebody who has a, uh, although I think it would be a problem trying to do the study, somebody with an autosomal dominant disease who has plaque in their brain and try, oh, because you know they're going to get the disease. In fact, you know the year they might get it. Uh, and then see whether or not the same thing happens to some human. The alternative uh, would be 
to find out if it would be removed in a person who has plaque but is normal, and do you get it to go away? But then, of course, you have to follow that person for a long time. The most, uh, and this is a discussion for which there are pros and cons in every case, the people on whom you might try it first are people who have relatively advanced disease and who have very little to lose. This is actually how the, the first of the amyloid imaging antibodies was determined to be uh, uh, correlated with plaque in the brain. They went to people in Arizona who had terminal cancer and asked them if they could scan them and then agreed to give their brains. And most of these people died within a year or two of getting um, their scans. And they were able to show in the autopsies that the people who had a positive scan, even though they were cognitively okay, had a positive scan, had plaque in the brain, and if they w had no plaque they had uh, on scan, they had no plaque in the brain. That was what convinced the FDA. The Pittsburgh studies we did were people we followed for a long time, and when they died, we autopsied them as part of the protocol and could correlate where the, the amyloid was with what happened in the brain. So if we assume that these uh, people with later disease uh, would tolerate anything that is ethically okay to do, just simply to see whether or not you could remove amyloid from the brain would probably do the least harm in somebody who already had disease. And the, there, there are two ethical views of this. I've uh, been over this with a couple of ethicists at Penn. Um, and uh, uh, it, a lot of it will deal with feasibility, comfort or discomfort, and how long it takes uh, for uh, the scans to be done. And if even with baby steps, the idea that you might focus on one small area, let's say, in the right frontal lobe, uh, where we know even surgically uh, people are not really disrupted if you have to cut a piece out for a tumor or something, and just see if we put low-level fuss into the right frontal lobe, as I said, where it isn't likely to hurt anything if there's an adverse effect, uh, event that we wouldn't have predicted. Just with low levels, but predicted from the mouth studies to allow the barrier to open and then follow those people for a couple of months and see whether or not the material came out. We don't know what the dynamics of this would be. For example, it might be that it would take, uh, assuming no harm, weekly or monthly exposures to get all of the material out uh, because it's going to come in pulses of opening the barrier up. The barrier then recloses in how long after... So four to six hours later, you've got a chance for a little rush out, and first thing you want to know is, is there any side effect of that? But maybe, depending on how much they have in their brains, and if you want to clear it all, you have to do a couple of um, uh, positions to the same place in the brain to prove that it would remove it. Then I think uh, if you show that you can remove it, uh, question number two becomes, can you uh, apply it widely enough in the brain to be able to remove or disrupt uh, plaques uh, everywhere in the brain. And uh, my favorite question, do you need to get all of the amyloid out or if you get 50% of it out, is that okay? My feeling that you need to get more out, although there are some data that suggest that some of the people get better when you get some of it out. Uh, some of you have heard me talk about an iceberg analogy. So if there's an iceberg, there's a lot of really cold water coming off of that iceberg. If you reduce that iceberg's volume by 50%, a foot from the iceberg, there's still a lot of really cold water. If you reduce the size of frontal puck by 50%, there's still an immense store, even if you, uh, once you stabilize, coming off in the equilibrium that would probably be enough to continue to uh, maintain the pathological cascade. So with FUS, you actually have a reason to think that you might be able to get it all out depending on how fast, uh, how, how much comes out with one shot at a time, uh, and certainly focus in a major way on the major areas in which it's occurring. Most interestingly, um, if I can go back very quickly to, and this was a discovery made in the disease, the, the area of the brain that was kind of a surprise that people didn't notice right away here is the precuneus or the posterior cingulate. And it turns out that this is a, an immensely important, nobody paid much attention to this until Satoshi Minishima in the late 90s pointed out that there was a lot of pet 
uh, energy decrease in this region. We were always focused on these areas, the biparial areas for uh, pet. But then he showed that it was uh, severe here, and then when we did the first PIB scans, all we saw were the subfrontal area and this area. This turns out to be a huge, uh, important area for short-term memory. It's activated uh, strongly by recent memory function. So one of the first places that I would go would be to that region to see if you weren't going to take it all out, if you take it all out of there, do you see any improvement in memory function uh, over a short period of time? But we have more questions than answers at this time. And there's a rationale for putting, as all the companies have for their antibodies, where should you apply your drug? Where should you apply a receptor blocker? Where should you apply an antibody, which takes a long time to get out? Where should you apply a, uh, an enzyme inhibitor? They're all predicated on the fact that you won't know right away whether you've had an effect. Um, the only thing that we know is that in the average studies of bapinuzumab, they didn't see strong effects, even though slowly a lot of it came out and that the few people who had amyloid come out of their brains who had mild to moderate disease who were in the first vaccination study did not have an improvement. Now, just a month ago, uh, Biogen uh, released top-line results of their antibody which, uh, that is directed toward oligomers and fibrillar forms of uh, amyloid and said that uh, within a year they saw an improvement in cognition testing and a decrease in amyloid scanning, uh, on amyloid scan of the amyloid in the patients who they were studying. Uh, this has rocked the world. Uh, no one has seen the data yet, uh, only the presentations, the brief presentations there. But if it is true that a, there is a way to get um, immediate removal and you could potentially associate that with some improvement over a rapid period of time, in my world we're used to waiting two years for something to show us that it slows down progression, that would be terrific, and it would speed up uh, uh, Fuss's application. But the history of disease modification drugs has been, uh, we started with six-month trials, we went to one-year trials, we went to 18-month trials, and now two things are happening. The first is the trials are getting longer in order to let separation occur between placebo and, and uh, uh, active drug, and uh, we're going backwards in time trying to go to earlier and earlier and mild and even pre-symptomatic because not as much cell death, not as much tangle formation, not as much damage has occurred. The big question will be, if you remove it, can you stop or slow down the cascade that we see lead to the clinical changes of the disease? That, of course, I mean, if we get it all out and, and they don't change it all, uh, that will be a, a difficult outcome for us. It means we have to go after a different target. And there are people who believe that. I think that the, the jury is absolutely still out on whether amyloid will help humans. Uh, but I do think that the best bet would be to get as much out as you can. Uh, and of course, you know, if you set your trial for a year and a half, that's not a guarantee that all of it comes out. You saw a couple samples in the antibody study uh, that I showed um, uh, near the end here, where uh, you know this is a person at the end of the trial. He started with a lot, and he still has a lot left. You know, with this. You know, was this a person who didn't seem to have much of a change? I'd be very curious about whether they were able to correlate either the percent gone or the, the, the uh, uh, smallest amounts and whether or not there were cognitive changes, but I have not seen those data yet. Uh, anyway, that's where we are. So there are potentials for preclinical studies, potential for MCI studies, and certainly potential for people with um, uh, mild to moderate disease, especially if it's shown that FUS can remove it quickly or faster than any of the other methodologies are able to do this. These drugs, the antibody studies, are all limited by the fact that um, the amyloid coming out of the brain uh, leads to, uh, in a certain number of cases, but almost everybody, it seems, if you take the concentration up too high, cerebral edema and swelling. Sometimes it's symptomatic and headaches and confusion. Sometimes it's not. Or hemorrhage. Uh, because uh, of um, difficulties with amyloid that's in the vessels potentially uh, being moved around and, and resulting in a weakened wall and a hemorrhage, a micro hemorrhage most of the time. So no one can give too much of the antibodies too quickly. We don't know what the risks would be of trying to open the barrier in this fashion and let material come out 
whether that would be the same kind of risk or whether it wouldn't have that risk. And that's one of the reasons that, uh, you know, the first studies are kind of cautionary and to be carefully observed. Is the mouse model close enough where you can look at that, or the mice don't have that kind of response, so you can't even get a hint? Can't tell. Can't tell. I thought the interesting thing was that the, the mice also improved their cognition. Yeah. Uh, which, you know. Right away, right? Like an I mean, the mouse model is not, people talk about it as a model of Alzheimer's disease. It's really a model of, of amyloid accumulation. Uh, it's not a model of, of disease per se. Uh, there is no, there are no tangles in the mouse. The mouse model produces lots of amyloid, but its tau is uh, markedly uh, different than human tau, so they don't form the aggregates. We have a couple questions from the audience here. Uh, first question is, what would be the preferred patient populace for a feasibility study with SUS, uh, in MCI or advanced AD? The first part of the question again, please. What would be the preferred patient populace for a feasibility using, uh, using SUS? A preferred population, th there's no one answer to that. A preferred population uh, might be people with moderate disease uh, to find out whether or not they, uh, whether or not plus works in removing amyloid and then seeing if it helps them or not. Uh, but they already have significant disease and they are not likely to be helped by any new therapy. Or even someone with severe disease who could not qualify for any of the current trials that are going on. Um, the person with MCI has got a long, useful lifetime, and therefore uh, you might be more hesitant to do that. I'm not sure it matters all that much. Uh, the problem with doing it to a person who has severe or moderately severe disease is whether or not they fully understand the implications of it when we don't understand the risks of it. And we could find out more by doing it to normal humans, but uh, normal humans wouldn't show us uh, any of the risks associated with amyloid, they would merely show us whether or not normal humans could tolerate low levels of, of, uh, of uh, uh, ultrasound. Uh, so I, I think the people who have the most drive to be studied are people with either preclinical disease or MCI, well, I should say everybody with either MCI uh, and an E4 that they know, which means they know they have the disease, or people with mild to moderate disease would be uh, people who would be willing to try it, uh, and those are probably where we would end up using it. Although I think if you had a debate and you told either side of the debate to take one side than the other, they would probably all give you answers. There is no particular one best place to do it. Normally we do it in normals first. It may already have been done in normals, I don't know, but uh, normals might show us they tolerate it, but we know that people tolerate it even with high levels. Uh, but they would not show us any of the potential risks, for example, of uh, abnormalities in reaction to opening the barrier in the middle of an area with amyloid. They wouldn't uh, have the same kind of changes that would show you uh, uh, edema. Uh, they, they don't have vessels filled with amyloid and therefore wouldn't have whatever the uh, small but real risk is of, of having a hemorrhage. Uh, so I don't think it makes sense to do it in normals unless there are other uh, reasons that you might want to uh, open a barrier, such as for uh, uh, administering uh, oncological drugs or, or anti-inflammatory medications. Okay. We have another question from the audience here. From a clinical point of view, repeated fuss treatment might not be feasible, especially at a high treatment frequency rate. How would you recommend FUS is incorporated in the potential future treatment plan? Well, I wouldn't be able to make a recommendation, as much as I'd like to, I wouldn't be able to make a recommendation about incorporation in the treatment plan until I knew, uh, you know, how it worked. Uh, you know, it, it, the theory about how amyloid, I left these slides out, the theory about how amyloid accumulates in late onset sporadic disease is that we fail over time to remove it. Uh, as effectively as we should. And one of the reasons we think that is that one of the faults of APOE4 is it doesn't remove material as effectively as APOE3 does. So not only do you pile it up, but it piles up sooner in the 4s than in the 3s in whom it's piling up. Theoretically, if that is true, once you get it out, you have probably cleared the patient for another. Therefore, uh, once you've cleaned it, 
they their risk should be gone of getting the disease. That's a very power. It's a theory. It has to be tested with a with a study. But it's a very powerful reason to go after people who have early uh, 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 evidence of plaques and no evidence of clinical abnormalities. So there's a, a reason to try it first to find out if you can use it as a preventive. Um, you would have to tell me what the reasons are, questioner, for uh, not being able to use repeated uh, scans. Uh, you know, we'd like to find out as quickly as we could how much you could get out at a time. But starting initially, for example, and just targeting uh, the right frontal lobe plaque in a person who has disease is probably a very safe thing to do, uh, at least with respect to not causing um, uh, localized functional damage to brain. Now, it's something you have to find out about the risks of uh, the side effects, but that's been true of every therapy that we've used, whether it's been a, uh, uh, an antibody or a, an enzyme inhibitor. Uh, the difference is here, at least, you are focused on one small area for the early testing, whereas with the antibody, you would have to deal with problems all over the brain, and indeed, when they were problems, they were, they might, they're sometimes widespread, usually over the posterior aspects of the brain. So that's a, a great question, and I don't think we're ready to answer it yet. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And um, we should have a, we have a recording available. This week or so. Thanks again.